Hey, welcome to Vibe Church. You have found us in our series called Mate. This series comes from John 1. It's a thrilling series, an exciting series, and I know that God is going to bless you as a result. So, enjoy. I'm in a series called Made, and I want to bring the final installment today. So would you go with me one more time to our, our series scripture in John chapter 1. If you want to grab your Bibles, and let's stay standing for the reading of God's Word. It's going to be the final time we read this for this series. You can still read it anytime you want on your own. But, but for this series, it says, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let me read that final verse. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I want to close out this series with a simple sermon titled today, which is Made to Win. Made to Win. You're ready for this installment? All right, if you're ready, I want you to do something real real quick. Find five of your favorite people, and if you believe you're made to win, convince them they're made to win. Go real quick. Tell them you're made to win. You're made to win. Go, go, go. Thanks, worship team. So I need to mention that it's my wife's birthday weekend. She is the finest 42-year-old I've ever laid eyes on. And, uh, you know, what you need to know is I know my wife. Uh, I take great joy in knowing my wife. I'm a studier of Kira Smolkum. Uh, I have learned her ways. I, uh, I have been stalking her. For the, no, I mean, I've been watching her. Uh, for a long time now, and there is, there's just things I know about Kira. And we know this dynamic in our marriage. We, we talk about a lot that I know her, she hardly knows me. It's because I'm mysterious or random, one of the two, you know. It's kind of similar, but, but, but she's a creature of habit, and I, and I, know, I know Kira. I, I, know how to, I know how to get the mood right for Kira. If you just play 80s Australian hit songs, Man, something happens. She comes in, she becomes a new person. She starts singing ballads and she starts, she knows every single lyric. If you want to play meatloaf, you, you want to, you want to, any, anything, I'm telling you, anything from the 80s, she is an aficionado on all things 80s hits. But I know Kira so much that I even know what she likes before she likes it. It's very handy when it comes to buying birthday gifts because. If I was to ask Kira, what birthday gift would you want? She would be like, I don't know. Anybody know those kinds of people? There's two types of people in this world. There's the, the people that don't know what they want and the people who have a list. And before, hey, what would you, they give you the list. Kira is the I don't know person, which means is a test, do you know me? That's the test. But guess what? I have passed that test so many freaking times. I know her. I know her better than she knows herself. So much so that I don't even ask her what she wants for her birthday. I just buy her stuff. Point in case is the gift that I gave her this week, which is a Garmin watch. You know, the kind of watch you track your, your data and your workouts and the technical stuff. You're all looking at me like you don't know what a Garmin watch is. Get physical, people, all right? It's a Garmin watch, you know, and you, and you track your steps and you can track your workouts and you can, you can join the run club with it. There's so many things that you can do with the Garmin. And at first when, when, when I was giving it to her, she's like, what, what is this? What, what, are you, what are you getting me? I'm like, trust me, trust me, you're going to love it. And sure enough, she loves it. Literally, like now she is addicted to tracking her sleep. She's tracking so many, her heart rate. She's like, oh, oh, I got a 95 today. That means 95 hours, she had a good night's sleep, as if you needed your watch to tell you that. <laughs> but, but it's like a game for her now. She loves her Garmin watch. But with her watch that she didn't even know she wanted, there's a learning curve, like how to use it. Which, by the way, reminds me of so many believers <laughs> that most of the time you either don't know what you've got or if you know what you've got, you don't know how to use it. Do you like that connection? That's, that's the way it is with most 
believers is that you either don't know what you've got or you don't know how to use it. And I want to be a really good pastor today and do my job to make sure on the final installment of this Made series, you know, firstly, exactly what it is you, you have as a believer. And secondly, you would know how to use what it is that you have been given. And I want to make sure you know this. I want to help you specifically with a significant element of your Christianity, which is called your Christian victory. Now, are we here? I'm talking about your Christian victory. I'm not just talking about your passivity. I'm not talking about your redundancy. I'm talking about the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. All right, we're going we're gonna to be like that. Okay, okay, let, let, me, let me wind this back a bit because what we know about John 1, over the past several weeks, we have been discovering, as John reveals, that Jesus, being the Word of God, was present at creation. When things began to be made, they began to be made by the Word of God and as the Word of God went forth. And in his opening few verses, John reveals that in him, Jesus, was life itself and and he goes on to say the darkness has not overcome it. So, so in other words, what John does is he does something absolutely remarkable. And, and he, in the verse five, in one verse, I wanna draw your attention to it. He presents two opposing elements, light and darkness. And at the same time, he reveals that there is an ongoing battle between the two. In John's words, he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, what you've got to understand about the nature of light is that the nature of light repels darkness. Light by nature pushes out darkness. When there is darkness and you bring light, darkness has to go. Okay, so John, what he does is he personifies both light and darkness as life and death. And in this one verse, he masterfully summarizes his entire gospel by revealing that the light, which is Jesus, has invaded the dominion of darkness, has overcome Satan who was powerless to defend it, revealing the word of God as victorious. That was a lot. What, what he was doing in this one verse, he summarizes his entire gospel. If you read through John, you're going to actually find that the whole, the whole idea of John, the concept of John, what John is trying to unpack is revealed in verse 5. Like, like a preview, he says, the light entered the world through the Word. The Word is Jesus. And, and what Jesus did is He pushed back darkness. In the beginning of time, before the world was created, the Bible says that the world was void and without form and darkness covered the earth. But as God began to create, the Bible says He spoke light and light came. And as He spoke light, light began to push back darkness. And the enemy has not been able to defeat it. He has not been able to defeat it. Therefore, the Word of God is victorious. Now, something you need to know from here, from the connection between John 1 and Genesis 1, is that we have been made in His image. I'm trying to give you some background here. We have been made. Now, 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 if you've been part of this series for the whole series, you would already understand that when the Bible says that you are made in His image, he's not, it's not talking about appearance, because God is spirit. So it's not that you look like God. I mean, you look good today, but you don't look like God, <laughs> You don't look that good. But, but it's not talking about appearance. It's talking about nature, that you are made with the nature of God. You have God characteristics when you, when you are born again, you are born into a new nature, a nature, a God-like nature, a godly nature. So you are born with the characteristics and the very nature of God. It's a victorious nature. It's what Paul presents to the Corinthians when saying to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, he says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what the apostle is doing is the apostle, as closing out his letter to the Corinthian church, he decides to conclude the letter 
with the reminder that they have been given a new nature and the trademark of that nature is victory. Okay, stay with me. I want to go at a pace today that wasn't as furious as the first service. I want to make sure I take everyone on the journey today. Sometimes I can get ahead of myself because we're talking about the victorious nature we have in Christ Jesus. I get a little excited. So I'm going to pace myself and make sure we all take notes and we all go along the journey together because you're going to need this. You're going to need this. You might not need it right now because it's Sunday morning and the victory has already been won for you. And so you come into a victorious setting. Everything's happy. Everything's mighty. You're feeling victorious. You want to fight. But Monday morning, the fight's coming to you. And you're going to need to know this. And you want to whip out your notes. And if you're not taking notes, you're going to go, where are my notes? You don't have them. I want you to have them. You need to know that you have been given a new nature. Believe it or not, this is extremely important for every single believer to know that, that to know what it is that you've been given. Now, I want to make sure I help you by understanding is that the truth of the matter is you have, you have a new nature. Meaning before Christ came into your life, you simply had what was called a sin nature. That is the nature that you were born with, was a sin nature. Because of the fall in the garden, we know this, and in that moment, we see sin entered the scene. And so everybody since that moment, born of a woman, has been born into sin. So your default nature being born was sin nature. But because of Christ and His victorious work on the cross, those that are born again are born now with not their, just their sin nature, but you're born into a new nature, which is a victorious nature. Thank you, Pastor Ben. You're with me. Now, now this is important to understand because I know what can be complicated is you're like, nature, I don't know that at all. Let me substitute for a moment the word nature with capacity. Because when you, without Christ, you have an incredible capacity to sin. That you are born with this, just this capacity to sin. If you don't believe me, that means you've never seen a two-year-old tantrum. <laughs> they just have a capacity to sin, to go mental. You have this capacity to go crazy. It's just in your nature because you were born with that capacity. Now, now this, is, this is important because this is not only unique to unbelievers, by the way. Because even as a believer, you also have this capacity. That's why, as, even as a believer, you have, you have to times struggle with sin. I don't know why we're so quiet. It's like, not me, Pastor. Yes, you. <laughs> Stop canceling yourself like you're some holier than thou. Even as believers, we struggle with sin. Can I get an amen? amen? Like, let's be the real church. Let's just get real. Let's just let pretenses go today. No one judging you. Just go ahead and judge yourself. I am a sinner. Because this is the capacity that we have as unbelievers and as believers. The difference is as an unbeliever, an unbeliever cannot resist sinning because they, they don't have the capacity to not sin. On the other hand, the believer, while still struggling with sin, has the capacity to resist sin because Jesus overcame it, freeing us from the enslavement to Sin, this is what Romans 6, 6 says, by the way. Can we put that up there? Paul wants the church to know that we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. See, see, see pre-Christ, you were enslaved. You had no choice. Like a slave, whatever sin wanted to do, sin did. So sin controlled your life. But now that you've been set free from sin, you are no longer slave. The chains have been broken. So now you have the choice to sin or not to sin. You have the choice. You have the, the choice. Now, I, I can feel the tension. I can feel that moment I see you have the choice. You're like, oh, whoa, 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 pastor. It's, sound, it's not so easy. Well, I didn't say it was easy. I didn't say it was not difficult. But you have the choice if you're born again. If you're born again, you've been set free. So now the choice is yours. Maybe I should actually change the word choice. If we're changing the word nature to capacity, maybe I should change the word choice to battle. You can battle against. Maybe that's more appropriate because it is a battle. It ain't easy. 
It is difficult, but it's still yours. You can battle against it or you can relent to it. This is very, very clear from Scripture that those born again are born to win. They're born to battle. And so the very moment you're born again, you receive that new capacity, that that new nature. And this is the new nature. It's one that is victorious. It's given by Jesus so you can battle against and overcome sin. Simply because when when you were born again, you you, you were made with the new nature, and the new nature is a winning nature. This is probably the most basic way I can boil it down. It sounds... Uh, it sounds average to the Bible scholar, but it's the basic way I can do it that you've that you got winning on your side. Now, a good question to ask at this point would be, well, if, if I'm made to win, to win at what? To win at work? <laughs> to win at life? Not exactly, because there is actually a significant battle that every believer needs to know how to win. But to know how to win this battle, you ideally need to identify your enemy. Now, I've been, I've been building something for a little while. It's a, it's a mentoring program for business leaders and executives. And, and it's simply taking all my pastoring tools and my pastoring experience and putting it into the business realm. The only difference is I don't have to be as nice in business as I do as a pastor. Synergistic, you know what I mean? You've got you to let it feed. And Because and, as a pastor, you're trying to help people understand what God has for them, and you have to be really nice because people are resistant to pastoring. But in business, people are open to it. It's crazy. It's amazing. You just change the paradigm and people, like, because business leaders and executives, they want to win. They're into it. They're in it to win it. They're, they're like, man, coach me. Show me. But, but, but Christians are so resistant. Oh, I don't know about that, pastor. I don't know if I can do that. And so what I did is I've, I've taken all the tools and the techniques that you find in Scripture and you actually just apply them to business. It's amazing. And so I've developed this series of, of spiritual and, and, and I would say philosophical leadership tools that I'm using now in helping executives win. And one of my favorite ones is philosophy number six. Yeah, you don't know what it is because I haven't taught you yet. You're all like, oh, yeah, that one. No, philosophy number six. Philosophy number six says it doesn't have to rhyme all the time. And I know it rhymes. <laughs> That's the whole point. I'm clever. But it doesn't have to rhyme all the time. And I developed this tool because I find so many humans who love a quippy statement that they can tattoo on their life or write on their wall that actually doesn't even work. But because it rhymes and it's catchy, we love to peddle it. We love to push it. We love to own it. Like, man, that's my, that's my saying. And it becomes a statement and a goal for life, but it doesn't work. Like, I don't know if you've heard this one, but I hear a lot of preachers trying to push this one. This is the, this is the one they push. They push the enemy is the enemy. Oh, God bless that. I can beat that. The enemy is the enemy. That, and, and it sounds so good. Like, I can subscribe to that. Because I know me. I deal with me. I look at me every day in the mirror. Every time I go to step out, I got me in my head telling me that I can't do it, telling me that I don't have the the pedigree, telling me that there's someone better than me. I, I know. So the enemy feels like the enemy. The problem is you are not your enemy. The enemy is your enemy. The devil is your enemy. It's just that the devil sounds like you. How else do you think the devil sounds? When the devil comes through your thought life and the devil comes into your mind, it sounds a lot like you. That's why it's so successful. But if you misplace it and you start calling the devil you, you'll be battling against you, trying to defeat something that cannot be defeated because you're already victorious in Christ Jesus. Therefore, you're just stuck in the place. Now, this whole thing is subtle and seductive. Because the truth of the matter is that you, one of the most dangerous things to the modern Christian is the self-help ideology. The, the self-help. Like, like I could subscribe to some self-help technique to be better in this life. The problem is you can't help yourself. You can't do it. You're the one stuck. Actually, the Bible makes it... More clear, you were dead in your trespasses. 
I don't know if you've encountered many dead people. They don't do a lot. But when you're dead, you need someone to bring life. And this is what it was with us in Christ that we were dead in our transgressions. We were dead in our trespasses. But thanks be to God who saved us from our death, who took the penalty of sin and death on His behalf, bringing life into our mortal bodies. Self-help doesn't work, but it sells. It sells. It's perpetuated. It's cancerous to the Christian faith. Because I don't need more help from myself. I need help from my Savior. You know what the self-help... Uh, ideology will do, the self-help ideology will get you to just be more independent from God. You'll get you to a place where you say, God, I got this now. God, I'm good. I got this. You got me this far, but I got it from here. Thank you very much. Let me go and make my own moves. You know what the truth of the matter is? The longer I walk with Christ, the more dependent on Him I am. Like, like, like the more I walk with Christ, the more I realize I need you with every step. It used to be I need you with every step. Now I need you with every breath. Because as I walk with God, I realize the magnitude of what He's called me to. When it, Before I was ignorant. Before I was just in for it to win it. God, I'm with you. Let's go for it. Now I realize there's, a, there's other lives on the other side of this calling. Now I realize there's a whole. When we actually started the church, we, we were way riskier than we are now. Like, I'll, I'll be at, like, a conference and people tell me, oh, you know, tell us how you move. Like, you, you guys just do so much faith stuff. You're so risky as a church. And I always tell them, no, we used to be riskier. Because when we started, we really had nothing to lose. <laughs> like, we're in a living room. That's how we started. No one was kicking us out of our living room. But we didn't have, didn't have a mortgage to pay. We didn't have nothing. We were, just, we were just meeting together. And if it didn't work, we'd just start again. Because we were nimble and we were small. But now we've got stuff to lose. I'm more dependent on God than ever. I'm way more dependent on God. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning into prayer like I need it now more than it was just a nice to have. It's a need to have because I know that on the other side of every decision is wait now. Because we've got some stuff to lose. And that's the maturity in Christ. It's not that I'm helping myself, but I have a Savior that's walking with me and sustaining me and holding me when I don't know what to do. And if I don't know what to do, I'm playing it safe. It's not, it's not self-help. It's Savior help. That's the story of the believer. That a Savior, a Savior, a Savior. Now, of course, I understand what it's like that the enemy is the enemy because you're so critical of yourself. What's the problem? I, sometimes I feel like we've got to be critical of ourselves. Like, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not the devil, the, the inner critic. Sometimes you could be better. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, the person who's like, oh, no, just don't be critical of yourself. They turn up late to church and they're like, oh, no, I'm late. No, nope, that's fine. No, be better. Be, be like, you know what? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Feel the conviction. Going to be better next week. That's how you're meant to critique. I'm meant to be making friends. I feel like I'm making enemies. Okay. <laughs> it's subtle. It's subtle. It's subtle because you need a savior. This is essentially what Paul is exposing and he's confronting when he writes to Romans in Romans chapter 7. Check this out. I love the tension that Paul brings realistically now. But as I read this, I need you to remember this is an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is the one mandated with the mission to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says this, so the trouble is not with the law, for it's spiritual and good. The trouble's with me, for I'm all too human, a slave to sin. Check this out. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I don't want to do what, I want to do what is good, but I don't, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. What Paul articulates there is the tension between the new nature and the old nature, the sin nature and the victorious nature. That though I'm born again and I'm in Christ Jesus, 
Jesus and I now have a new nature being set free from slavery to sin. I still have sin living in me. It's no longer I that's sinning. It's not me, my identity, but it's still sin dormant in my life. It's still sin in my life. So there is a process now where I got to choose, sorry, I got to do battle with sin. Where because I have a new nature and the old nature is still present, trying to stay remaining and taking up territory in my life, I have to lean into my victorious nature, draw some battle lines and start to say, sin, we're going to battle. Sin, we're going to war. Sin, it's time to fight. That is the position that Paul is presenting. He's like, I got some stuff in my life that keeps on coming up and it keeps coming back and it keeps rearing its head. And I know I'm victorious in Christ Jesus, but what I've realized, that ain't me, it's sin. But if the enemy's the enemy, I miss the fact that I can't battle me. Because how do I be victorious if I defeat me? No, no, I'm victorious, but I've got to do battle with sin. I've got to draw some lines in my life, and I've got to start to war. In other words, Paul reveals that the real battle, the real battle is in overcoming sin. I I wanted to show you this scripture. I forgot to give it to the team. I don't know if they got it up there, but I I found it in the first service. And it's uh, in in 1 John. I want to read this to you. Did we end up getting that? I forget if I gave it. Yes, we did. Excellent. Look at this. Okay, 1 John chapter 3. This is a crazy passage. I don't know if you can handle this. If you're feeling like timid, just close your eyes. Block your ears. That was your warning. Straight Bible. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God, is born again, makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. What? John wants to make sure he emphasizes to the Christians is to know that now you have a new nature in Christ, which is a victorious nature. The sin that was so dominant in your life, you've been set free from. So now what was un- you were unable to beat before, you are now victorious over now. Because of Christ and your victorious nature, you have to start to do battle with that, ne- that old life. You have to start drawing the battle lines and actually start to identify what am I going to go to war against because I can win. It is, it is unacceptable for a believer to claim addiction. certain things you say that you get the tense. You can't say I'm a born again believer and then in the next breath say, oh, but I'm addicted to this. Every addiction is enslavement that Christ has set you free from. You may still struggle with sin, but there is no way that you can be addicted if Christ reigns in your life because your new nature, your old nature was stuck and slave to sin. Your new nature is born again, victorious in Christ Jesus. The problem is you just haven't done battle with it. You haven't done the battle. You haven't drawn the line. You've lived with it and you've allowed it. And you're saying, you know what? That's just too hard. I don't know if I could beat that. Yeah, yeah, I'm victorious, but I don't know if I... See, see, being victorious is the first step to know what you've got. Putting it into practice is the next step. To put to work what I've got. (laughs) Because apart from Christ, you can't... You can do nothing. However, because of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And because I have this new nature, I need to understand I'm made to win. So my battle isn't to defeat me. My battle is to build me. How do we do that? I want to show you. But to show you, I need to show you with an Old Testament passage of Scripture. Look, we've got the worship team here. 
I feel like they're ready to battle. I'm ready to fight. I really want to get you on the battle line as well. That's my goal today is not to get you to shrink back from the battle, but to step up to the battle. And the way I'm going to get you to step up to the battle is to show you what you've got and how to use it. Because anybody would be prepared to fight if they knew how to fight and they knew what they were fighting with. So that is my goal for you as a believer born again in Christ Jesus to know what you have in your hands so that you will actually start to engage with the battle of the sin that's keeping you stuck and stopping you, holding you back from all that Christ wants to do in and through your life. And what you need to understand is in the Old Testament is that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, you have what's called types and shadows. They're a forecast or a pretense to what you will find and experience in the New Testament. So, so there are physical battles and physical things that happen in the Old Covenant that are illumination of what we can deal with as a spiritual experience in a New Covenant. Are you with me? So what you're going to find, and this is going to help you, that you're going to find that often in the Old Testament, God would call His people, the Israelites, to go up in battle against the enemy. The Israelites were called the people of God. The enemy were those that opposed God and His ways. And so whether it was the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Hittites, whatever the ites, God would call them to go up and He would often say, make sure you eradicate them. Now, I've heard a lot of woke Christianity who are saying, well, you know what, I just don't know if I can subscribe to the whole Bible because I don't know if I can believe in a Bible that God, you know, He advocates genocide. That's not what was going on. What He was indicating and illustrating, if you have the wisdom to apply it into your life, this is why you need the Holy Spirit as the interpreter and the revelator of Scripture, is God was revealing that the same way that they disobeyed God, and they often did, where they would leave some of the enemy uh, and they would make sure they would bring them into their homes and they would make them into their servants and they would even marry some of the enemy at times. It was an indicator that if you do this in your life, where you leave areas of your life in sin and you don't address it and you don't eradicate it, it will be the very thing that ends up corrupting your life or keeping you stuck, stalled, having to go around and around and around again. So He gives us an Old Testament picture of what happens in a new covenant setting that we can apply spiritually. So now you know that background, I need to show you in Deuteronomy. But before we go to Deuteronomy, let me give you the new covenant picture of the Old Testament setting. Can I do that real quick? Because we read it earlier in in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Worship team, come up with me because I'm going to need you, I'm going to need you. Everyone's quiet, I'm going to need you, I'm going to need you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So hold that in your mind. Be thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, you're going to find this passage that talks about the laws concerning warfare. And check this out. It says this, a set of rules that the Israelites had to follow when engaging with the enemy. It says this, when, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, You shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, when you're facing errors in your life that you say, you used to say, I was addicted. When you're facing errors in your life that say, man, I'm never going to get free from that. When you look at errors in your life and you say, ah, man, that's generational. I don't know if I'll ever break it. It was in my father. It was in my grandfather. And it's running in me. You've actually made an excuse. You've determined that you're afraid of that thing. The Bible says the first thing to do, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Then it goes on to say this, and when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for the battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you the victory. And to give you the victory. Did you get that? The the, the New Testament, the new covenant is that God through Jesus has given you the victory. Under the old covenant, the type and shadow was when you draw near the battle, don't be afraid. In fact, there's three things. I need you to write these down. Firstly, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not dismiss it like you'll never beat it. Do not say that it's too big for me. Do not say that this is a hereditary thing, that this is a generational thing, that this is stuck within me. I'm not resigning to the fact that this is just a part of my life. No, I will not do that. I am not afraid of that thing. Secondly, God is with you. 
the priests had to come and remind the people, even if the enemy looked bigger than them, even if they had more horses and more chariots and they were more intimidating, the priest was to remind them that God is with you. And thirdly, God is fighting for you. See, this is crazy. This is crazy. I could tell you story after story where the Israelites would go into battle and they wouldn't even swing one sword. God would fight for them. And this is what it's like in our life. God says, first thing, don't be afraid. Start calling some sin out. Start calling some areas out. Start, then start drawing some battle lines. Say, sin, this has been in my life too long. Lust, I'm coming after you. There's things, anger, the days are done. Literally start drawing some battle lines. Remind yourself, God is with me. That gives me the confidence to draw the battle line in the first place. And then it says, go into battle. No. Then it says, start fighting. No. No, it doesn't say that. It says, don't be afraid. God is with you. God is fighting for you. So you draw the battle lines. God does the fighting. 